Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, talk by Lorenzo. I'm just going to give a wee bit of background information for people that have never seen or heard Lorenzo speak before. And it's just a basic outline of what he is all about. And then I'm just going to let him go into the talk. So basically, Lorenzo has been an activist since 1959. And amazingly, he started at the age of 12. Um, he was involved in sit-in protests in Chattanooga that helped to end racial segregation at the time. Following that, he was drafted during the Vietnam War and spent two years in the army, where he became an anti-war activist at that time. And then following that, he got, this is when he, he um, went in to join the Black Panther Party. And there's extensive references to Lorenzo's active, activist life if you wanted to Google it. I mean, there's lots of stuff and articles being published about him. But um, I think it's basically his talk this evening is about his thoughts in the here and now. And so I think we should just let the meet, open the meeting um, and let Lorenzo speak to us. And after that, we could hear our question and answer, answer session. So, welcome, Lorenzo, and the, the flare is yours. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank my Scottish comrades for <clears throat> inviting me to speak. Uh, it was quite a surprise to, out of the blue almost, uh, <clears throat> be getting such an invitation. I mean, I'm honored. And, uh, but I hadn't been to Scotland in over 20 years. And um, I guess whatever I said at the time, surprising to me, uh, had a lasting impact. And uh, for that, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, and that leads to the talk today. Well, I'm going to talk somewhat about my life, you know, my history of this. <clears throat> and, um, but more importantly, I wanted to, to talk to you about. Um, you know, ra the, the, the radical approach that we need to take to austerity uh, measures by our various governments and the collapse of capitalism. Uh, we need to talk about these things, which are extremely important. Now, in the United States, I mean, well, first of all, don't try to judge the United States by Scotland. It has a whole separate history. Uh, it's got a long history of racism, and, and it's hard to understand it unless you have thoroughly researched it or lived in the country. And, uh, but what I will tell you is that if you're talking about the capitalist system, in the United States, the capitalist system was based on the enslavement and the system of shadow slavery um, of the African people. That's the first thing that you have to bear in mind. And uh, since that time, you know, every analysis that we have to make that's, that's going to be fruitful has to be with an understanding that the, that the racist system or racism within the, the entire judicial, economic, social, and even the lab, labor stru structure, all of that uh, is, is, is affected by racism. And so for a young black man, you know, in the 1960s who came of age, and at the same time that the uh, civil rights movement was erupting in the United States, we're talking about the, um, like I said, the early uh, late 50s and early 60s. Uh, I became involved with, at that time, the first movement was the uh, youth movement of the uh, National Association for Advancement of Colored People. And uh, it was a very conservative, business-oriented organization, except for the youth wing. And the youth wing was the most hell-raising wing of all. We always challenged the adults, many of whom were extremely conservative, some of whom were in bed with the power structure. We always challenged them, and we always put pressure on them. Well, 1960, the, um, that was the year of the so-called sit-ins. This is the second phase of the civil rights movement I'm talking about. First phase was with Dr. King in Birmingham, Alabama, and that lasted, uh, you know, late 50s up to 1960. 1960, a new movement came into existence of, of primarily black youth. They were not led by Dr. King. They were not led by the old line uh, preachers and all these, these sorts of people. They were, in fact, led by uh, the youth themselves 
and they were community oriented. So their their thing was they called for sit-ins. And so if you you heard of the Occupy movement, well, the sit-ins were basically the Occupy movement of its day, actually, uh, and was far in, in advance of the of the Occupy movement that came out in the late in the, in the late late two thousands. So we're talking about a kind of movement where the youth, uh, they realized that what they could do, what they could do is to go into white places of business and disrupt them, just sit in there, sit in those places, demand that they be served food. And this was at a time of racial segregation. Black people weren't being served in so-called white restaurants. And there was a system of racial segregation, which uh, put it in law that black people had no rights, that white people were bound to respect, and that uh, you could be arrested, maybe even killed, for demanding basic uh, human rights. And uh, so this is the context that we're talking about. And these black youth uh, had a demonstration in downtown Chattanooga in the, in the department stores. There were three or four different department stores, major chains in the South. And they were practicing uh, racial segregation. They just went along with the system. And so the students went in and demanded to be served. They wouldn't serve them. And they just sat there, sat there all day. And as long as they were there, the business owners couldn't make any money because the white people weren't going to come in and sit next to these blacks. In fact, they couldn't do it because black people occupied all the seats. And so um, this went on for quite some time. This went on for several days. And it disrupted the entire um, economic system of that city. But more importantly, it um, empowered the, the black community in a way that it never had been before. And so myself, when I was really young, I, I was about 11, 12 years old, marched from uh, the, the sector where black people were restricted, you know, in terms of a, a segregated housing. We, we marched from our areas down to the center of, uh, of, of town to, you know, occupy the city center. And uh, while we were coming, we were hit with high pressure water hoses. Uh, they, they threw uh, tear gas bombs at us. They did all kinds of stuff. Now, you know about what happened in Birmingham, but most people don't know what happened in Chattanooga. And Chattanooga was even more dramatic than Birmingham uh, because the people fought back. You know, they weren't turning the other cheek. They weren't, you know, uh, laying there and allowing themselves to be beaten. They got up and started fighting. And they, they fought the Ku Klux Klan and, and racist white students inside of the department stores. And they also fought them in the streets. You know what I'm saying? They, they, I'm not physically fighting them. I'm not talking about turning the other cheek and praying for them. I think I'm breaking the jaw. And uh, they fought these racists to a standstill. And, of course, the police came in huge numbers. The police and the, uh, and the uh, sheriff's department from that area came in, and came in large numbers. And, and other uh, local uh, depart so-called law enforcement departments came to try to put down these uh, what became an insurrection. And um, so they came down there, and, and this, this stuff carried on for days. So they arrested this group of students, the first group of students, and they carried them off to jail. And no sooner had they done that, another group ran in and took their place. You know, and the, so they had to go through all this stuff again. And uh, they had beaten the uh, Klan and the uh, white students to a pulp, to be quite honest. And they, this was not expected to happen. Blacks were supposed to turn another cheek or pray or whatever and allow themselves to be beaten. And they refused to do that. They refused to accept any indignities from these racists. And they beat them unmercifully. Unmercifully. It was something that the whites had never seen. And uh, they were terrified absolutely terrified. And, um, and they saw that they weren't going to be able to put down this movement with force of arms, with, with massive police numbers, uh, bringing in the National Guard. They weren't going to be able to put it down with anything. And at the same time, this, these protests were going on in cities all over the South. As I think some 60 cities were having these protests around this time in 1960, we're talking about, in the early 1960. And um, so this, this thing was, uh, was building, it was powerful, it was building to an even larger crescendo. And um, we were able to force the cops and the city authorities to stop racial discrimination inside of these department stores, at least, and other aspects of daily life where black people were being subjected to racism. We were able to, to stop that as well over the course of time. Now, I'm not saying that we um, stopped all racism at all, I mean, every bit of racism, but we certainly defeated the um, power structure and the entity that was keeping it alive and in our face every day. And that's extremely important to understand that. It, it, it's like um, 
you know, when you deal with this, uh, all the, the, the Southern culture and and, and the, the Confederate uh, monuments and all this garbage has been here for a long time, a long time in the South. And uh, we were fighting it back then, trying to defeat it. And we did defeat many aspects of, of the, uh, the segregation system, the system that was in place by law. Now, you might ask yourself, you know, well, what, what, what was the result of all this? Well, the result was, you know, black people who had been historically oppressed for hundreds of years finally rose up and demanded rights as a human being. And of course, as a citizen of the United States and so forth. But the, the, the fact that the masses of people rose up and when they did that, they pushed the state back so forcefully that the state had to grant concessions. They had to grant concessions. The state and the federal government, we're not just talking about state in terms of, you know, one of the southern states. They were like 16 southern states. But no, we're talking about the entire government. Because even though there was different kinds of segregation in the north, they in fact were being subjected to racial oppression. They were being forced into ghettos and what have you. So we're talking about a, a historical moment where black people rose up in, in numbers and fiercely fought back, something that had never happened before. And this protest movement lasted almost 20 years. You're talking about from, uh, well, 57 to, to um, 77, you'd be talking about. That, that protest movement lasted for a long time. That changed form at the later stages and so forth. And of course, the effect of um, COINTELPRO and all that and political assassination by the government has to be factored in. But the movement itself, which was based on the masses, not the leaders, it was based on the masses, that movement was able to advance rapidly, you know, in terms of what the politics was like, what the conditions with black people was like, and all of that. For me, I, um, I was never a leader. Let me make, make that point clear. I was always in the ranks of the organization, you know, and, uh, or the movement. And so after the, the first protest took place in Chattanooga, the massive protests, um, then I uh, later got involved with uh, protests around the city, continuing protests, but also got involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee sometime later. Uh, now, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was probably the most ma uh, militant wing of the actual civil rights movement. This is before the Black Panther Party, and I'll have to talk about that later. But this was the most militant wing. Uh, they believed in dire direct action. Uh, but they believed in, in, in at, at one stage, later on, he started believing in armed self-defense. They said that we can't stop the Klan and these racists from attacking us using purely uh, pacifist means. We have to resort to whatever other human beings on the face of earth have done, and that is to arm ourselves against white supremacy and, 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 and violence. And that's what they did. But the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was an or important organization. It was important in terms of the civil rights movement. Uh, it was an instrumental organization in creating the, uh, the protests. Many of the protests that have been attributed to Dr. King and other organizations were by these students who had the energy and the time and, and, and uh, who went into communities and, and talked to people and, and worked with people and lived among people, you know, and um, they were effective, extremely effective. In fact, they were so effective that they started to be assassinated um, by, um, you know, police authorities in the South. And uh, they started to be arrested in mass and they started to be beaten and, and other forms of terror, uh, you know, that they are employed. But it, it's still with all of that. They were not able to stop us from doing what we needed to do in terms of organizing black people in the South in particular. They weren't able to do it. And so uh, then uh, the 63 March on Washington, which many people have been told about and, and claim that all it was about was Dr. King's speeches and so forth and so on. And, um, and, and that was an important moment and everything. But that's what the media focused on. The organizers who actually created this thing, who called for it in the first place, was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And what happened is the government, the Kennedy administration, and the government, they, they turned around and tried to remove the student leadership and replaced it with these black preachers and these other organizations, adult organizations in the civil rights movement, that they knew were more pliable and compliant and not as militant. 
And so they were able to stifle that. And, and, and you know, John Lewis, you know, he just, just died and so forth. And, and, and um, they make out like he was such a wonderful person and this, that, and other. And in point of fact, he was a militant back then. He was a radical. He was calling for revolution in the South. Uh, he was calling for protests in the South, you know, massive protests. And he got that from SNCC, of course. And, uh, and but to, to stifle this event, this the 63 March in Washington, the media took it over and they focused entirely on Dr. Martin Luther King's speech. And if you talk about it to this very day, most people will tell you all they remember was Dr. King's speech. And it was much more of it to, to, than that. Uh, and they they took um, John Lewis and uh, and forbade him to speak until he changed the nature of of his uh, presentation. And they wanted him to not call for revolution. They wanted him to not denounce the federal government and his foot dragging policies for so many years. And they wanted him to essentially just give up. And uh, I won't say that he totally gave up, but I'll just tell you this. After the march on Washington, he had, and he had been or, or the uh, chair at, one, at that stage, the chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, he was defeated after that. And the whole, po uh, whole uh, process of uh, organizing with SNCC changed after that because they said, we've been sold out. Uh, Dr. King and the, the, the white labor unions and all the rest of them have, dis have destroyed our effort to organize this this is a mass movement in the South. And so what they did over the course of time, and not much time, they removed John Lewis. He was, of course he was defeated in, in his attempts to get reelected. And Stokely Carmichael took over. And it, I don't know whether people know it or not, but it was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that came forward with the ideas of black power. And uh, in 1965, they weren't as developed as they would later become. But they, they, they took Lewis and, and pushed him out of the organization as a result of that. They felt like he had betrayed them. He had sold out to these conservative forces uh, at the 1963 March on Washington and other things that, that, that have never been disclosed very much in this period, except by people on the inside who knew about it. <clears throat> and um, so Stokely Carmichael took over, <clears throat> and it became progressively a more militant organization. It started uh, attacking the police uh, when they'd come down and beat, beat black people in the street. They, they pushed the segregated cops out, uh, in the South especially. Uh, they, they started uh, practicing armed self-defense against the Ku Klux Klan and other uh, fascist organizations, other racist organizations. Yeah. So um, in terms of this, uh, this was a massive step from, from the, the early uh, SNCC organization, which is just a youth organization, and it was working in the civil rights movement, but it was you know, just part of the overall campaign, and Dr. King was in, in the ascendancy. But after that, after that, they had changed their politics to, to go away from uh, pacifism to go away from uh, you know this whole idea that um, they can depend on the government, the federal government, to protect them and to give them their rights. <clears throat> they saw that that was totally and patently a false uh, assertion, a scam, and so they went away from that. And like I said, they started uh, organizing in a new fashion in the South. Once they start organizing the um, the poor people in the South into a um, a mass movement, an independent mass movement, it would not be dependent upon the Democratic Party, which the Democratic Party then, now and then subverted uh, radical organizations and they put them under the Democratic Party tutelage. And of course, they were under control after that happened. No matter what people tell you about it, if, if your organization or you are part of the Democratic Party uh, pro process or, or the uh, infrastructure. You've been sold out. You're selling out. <laughs> you're selling out, to be quite honest. And this is what we that's what we were uh, saying then. And we were fighting them from taking over SNCC as an organization because there were elements that wanted to go and join the Democratic Party, wanted to get money from the Democrats and 
and so forth and so on. You have that, and, and, you know, and even today, there are organizations that you think are independent or you think that are militant, like, uh, to be quite honest, the, the um, Black Lives Matter is a Democratic Party front group now. And uh, it's not the first one. It's not the only one. There are others in the black left, you know, the, the so-called uh, um, uh, Republic of New Africa folks. Um, they're also in the Democratic Party fold. And so this is a form of subversion, actually, what it is. It's um, a way to kill the militancy in organizations and to have you uh, adopt and accept the status quo, you know, adopt the, the, the so-called liberal left, as they call it in America. Well, I've never believed in that. I don't believe in that electoral politics anyway, never have. And I, I've seen that electoral politics is just a, a sellout, one, for radical forces to even do it, and two, it's not even effective. Most of the things, most of the rights that black people have won in America has been because of the ability and the willingness to get in the street and protest. That's it. You can't say Dr. King won anything. You can't say that any of the other so-called uh, big four or big six leaders won anything. And in point of fact, if, if it wasn't for the people in the street, it wasn't for groups like SNCC and later, of course, the Black Panther Party and all these, other, but that's a different stage. Then uh, nothing ever would have been won. And so it's important to understand that. Um, now, if we looked at this, this period, the, the end of the, you know, the end of the old civil rights movement, black power came into existence as a, you know, a youth tendency, a youth tendency, a spontaneous eruption against racism. Uh, cities all over the country, uh, black people rose up in rebellion against the white power structure and the so-called racial ghetto in the major cities. They rose up against that. And um, for years, uh, they were out of control uh, of the state. Uh, you had um, militant tendencies of all sorts that took on the cops, even kill cops. When the cops tried to invade the black community, uh, you had people uh, building all kinds of uh, uh, anti-authoritarian organizations, like for instance, um, in Detroit, the workers in the auto automobile industry created an organization uh, there in the various plants. And uh, they were creating their own union uh, because the, the AFL-CIO and, and uh, UAW, the United Auto Workers, was so racist, was so racist. So they started there to creating a, uh, a black-led uh, union, you know, and a radical union. And, uh, well, it eventually was crushed, but before it was crushed, it left a legacy that showed you one black, uh, black um, syndicalism, an example of black syndicalism that actually worked and actually um, was very effective, probably uh, other than in the, in, you know, in the earlier periods in the United States uh, when, the, when the IWW was doing things, the real IWW. I don't even consider what's around the days being the same thing. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, despite that, um, they were able to build a movement. As I said, that was just one example. And all over the country, there were instances where, where black people uh, took over school boards, uh, took over uh, the, the community. That's where community control, the ideas of community control came from. And, uh, and all this is going on. And of course, then there were these rebellions in, in Watts, California, in New, New Jersey, and uh, Cleveland and other cities. These rebellions were extremely important as well. They may not have been something favored by the ruling class and the liberals, but um, it was the throwing off, the throwing off of the kind of yoke of oppression that had uh, weighed heavily on us for so many years. So that's extremely important to understand. And Black Power was a diverse movement. It, you know, to be quite honest, it was a movement that had a, one wing was a, a cultural studies group and, and poetry, and the other wing was, um, you know, a radical wing that included the Black Panther Party and and other uh, militant organizations that uh, did organizing in the streets, fought racists, fought racism, and fought the cops, and tried to transform society uh, to be in a non-racist society. Now, um, 
the, the wing, when, when the Black Panther Party came into existence, it actually, uh, the first thing it did was to unite with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They don't, nobody likes to talk about this. Uh, it's supposed it didn't happen. There's all this other garbage you hear today. But in point of fact, this, this is what happened. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, its leaders were actually, uh, what you want to call it, drafted into the Black Panther Party by Huey P. Newton. And this is made public. People know about this at this particular time. And um, the um, also many important activists uh, that were in um, SNCC. And it was it was an organization on the verge of breaking up, but many of those organizers, you know, outstanding organizers, went into the uh, Black Panther Party for uh, as at the time it was known as the Black Panther Party for Self Defense. Now that name only lasted a year when it went from being a uh, militia to a uh, political organization, political party. But <clears throat> the most important thing to understand. Uh, in, in, in looking at a long swath of history, and I'm giving you a long swath of history. I'm not just talking to myself as an individual. Uh, I was a part of it, but I didn't run it. I, I uh, was affected by it and organized in the midst of it. That's important to understand. I always tell people that. I'm not some leader. I didn't found this, that, and the other. And uh, don't worship me. Don't worship me. Uh, I'm just an ordinary guy that uh, was placed into extraordinary circumstances. That's all I am. I'm not any hero or uh, this other stuff. <clears throat> and um, and then we get to, as I said, the founding of the Black Panther Party when, when SNCC was dying out. Uh, but their leaders were drafted in first. And then, you know, um, different members in SNCC, some of them joined, some joined, some of them didn't. I'm not going to claim that everybody joined in mass. That's not what happened. But some did join uh, immediately or or later on. It didn't matter. But you know, in fact, uh, one per one notable person is where it happened. He came out of SNCC. Um, so there are um, Chicago black leader, I should say, Chicago black Panther party leader, uh, Fred Hampton. Uh, he um, actually came out of SNCC. He he had been in SNCC. At any rate, um, the um, the Black Panther Party which was founded in 1966. Um, that's the year I got, uh, well, I, shortly after I got out of the army uh, around there. And, uh, but in 1966, the party was founded and um, it opened up a new path for black activism. One, it was not a civil rights organization, even though it, you know, it, it respected the civil rights movement and some of the works that it had done, but it was not a, a pacifist organization, first of all, and it was not a, um, as I said, a civil rights group. Its objectives were, they were socialists. They called themselves socialists and, you know, and uh, their whole foundation was based on socialism. Now, as an anarchist, I look back at it and it wasn't the kind of socialism uh, that I am in favor of at this point in life. But uh, at the time, it was a very radical organization. Um, because the civil rights movement practiced pacifism. Uh, they didn't practice pacifism, they practiced armed self-defense. Um, they raised up um, the ideals of Malcolm X over Dr. King, even though they respected Dr. King. And um, they um, also have said that they were revolutionaries and their objective was not uh, just to build a so-called black nation. They wanted to uh, transform the United States. They want to turn the United States into a socialist country and to end capitalism uh, completely. And so um, they came up with a 10-point program. And don't ask me to repeat the 10-point program. I don't, <laughs> I'm 73 years old. I can barely remember what I ate the, the, the yesterday. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, don't, <laughs> the, the, more importantly than the, than, the, than the program itself, uh, which was instrumental for organizers and for the community to unite with, uh, more importantly, was that they were trying to transform, radically transform the United States of America away from being a racist nation, away from being a capitalist nation, you know, away from being an imperialist nation. They were trying to transform it. And then this was at a time when the Vietnam War was raging uh, out of control. And so uh, they were trying to even organize black uh, GIs, and SNCC had been the one who started this 
organizing black GIs from um, GIs being um, soldiers, black GIs from um, fighting in the Vietnam War. They wanted them to drop out, and some and many did, you know, but it wasn't easy to do. And um, it also was um, something that was really it was punishable uh, by the authorities, by the higher level staff. And um, so we had to organize for I started doing this, in fact, when I was in the Army. I started um, in, we were in Germany. The uh, president of the United States, uh, Lyndon Johnson, um, had said that he was going to expand upon the Vietnam War, bring in more troops, and increase the, the level of the, uh, in, you know, in, the, the invasion. That's what he really was, the invasion. He was going to increase the, the war effort. And so he wanted to bring in another 500,000 or 600,000 troops. And he wanted to, instead of dealing with the hassle, as he saw it, of the um, draft, where the anti-war movement was all over him, you know, the anti-war movement was extremely powerful uh, in, in anti-draft resistance. So to get around that, what he decided he was going to do was to take all of the soldiers that he already had and you know the United States occupies well now they got 900 bases uh, in foreign countries, and uh, but he wanted to take the troops out of France where they w originally were there for a while up to that point, and um, out of Germany where I was and there was a large number of troops there, and uh, as many as 100,000, and he also wanted to take troops out of you know other countries uh, that had been there since World War II. And he wanted to take those troops in large numbers and, and them and others they could get either through the draft or whatever. And then they would send them away well, from South Korea as well. Uh, and they would send those troops to Vietnam. And they'd be the fresh uh, expeditionary troops that they felt could um, turn the battle in, into their uh, behalf, their way. And uh, what they didn't count on was that we would the troops themselves, the, the soldiers would, would uh, have something to say about this. We would res resist. And that's what we did. Uh, well, first of all, there was an organization created called the American Servicemen's Union. And it sprang up and it spread all over the world, especially all over the places where, you know, there were military troops, American military troops. And uh, they devised a plan to resist. And um, I was one of those in, in, in Germany. I was in Germany. I was one of those that came aboard to figure out a plan to, to fight this. And so we started a campaign of getting uh, troops to, to um, desert, uh, desert the army and go to uh, a third country. And uh, in our instance, in Europe, the third country, I think, was, uh, well, there were a number of them. There was Sweden, Switzerland, and... Um, Norway, I think it was Norway as well. And they were taking in American soldiers and giving them political asylum. And so I was organizing it. I was one of those organizing. I'm not telling you I'm the only one who's doing it. No, I'm not. Uh, there were others as well in, in uh, various parts of Germany and France and other places that were doing the same thing. Well, I was in Mannheim, Germany, which was where the constant, well, one of the major concentration camps were located that, that the Hitler regime had. And uh, that was also the major, the same building was where the American government had um, its troops, its, its stockade or its military prison. And uh, so we were organizing, we were getting people out of the country and so forth. And in my case, uh, I organized this stuff for about a year. I did it for about a year, maybe. And then uh, they came down on me. The military police arrested me or tried to arrest me uh, one night at a uh, social club where all the, you know, the GIs were. They tried to come and get me, and it started a riot. Uh, they beat the MPs up and, and took their guns and everything else and ran them up out of there. And uh, so they had to uh, come and get me at, at another time in another place. 
and they did. I was in a, another a location, and um, I was have considered that I was set up to be in this location, you know, by uh, my uh, commanders at the base where I was located. Uh, but at any rate, they sent me to this place, and the um, the military police came. They assaulted me, beat me up, uh, knocked on my knocked the tooth out, and everything. Just you know, just literally beating me because I had resisted when they uh, tried to take me before, and some of them got all beat up and all that stuff. And so they were they were going to get their revenge. So they beat me up and they threw me in a in the military jeep, and they drove me to um, this uh, stockade or this military prison, and I stayed there for quite some time. Then I got out when uh, the charges, they were trying to give me a, a treason charge, which would have put me in prison forever uh, or had me, you know, you know executed. You know, although they claimed they weren't doing that back then. That's a lie. They did execute people. They were hanging. But at any rate, um, I, I was there and I got out of that facility uh, when the German anti-war movement and um, the, the these radical um, Radical GIs, these soldiers, got together and they got an attorney. They hired an attorney and they started having demonstrations at the base, which was unheard of. Unheard of that someone would have a demonstration at a military base, but they started doing it. And uh, it unnerved the officials. And um, whereas they would have unmercifully dealt with me, I don't know, uh, I could have at least gotten life, double life in prison or could have been uh, even, ex you know, sentenced to death. I don't know. Uh, for sure, but I'm just telling you what, what, what the deal was at that particular time in history. I was able to get out uh, eventually after the trial. They held the trial, and they wanted, and the judge said he had the intention of trying to give me life in prison or the death penalty. And he said that he um, reassessed this because there was such an uproar um, in, in Germany and parts of Europe after I'd been captured and after they put me on trial. So I was able to get out of this stuff. They gave me a, a pretty lenient sentence, you know. And I think I'd almost done all of it within a year's time. And they got me out of there and they shipped me back to uh, the United States. And, and, you know, eventually I got out, uh, out of the military, came home. And when I came home, I became active in the anti-war movement. As I said, the, I was a um, snake had uh, its focus on the Vietnam War, and especially the large number of blacks going into the military and serving as cannon fodder. So I got involved with that. And then uh, when the Black Panther Party came along, I started, uh, and they, they sent their newspapers to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So I got their newspapers and started selling them in Chattanooga. And that caused me a great deal of harm. Uh, the police would uh, stop me and uh, you know, push me around, might might beat me up or whatever, and uh, seize the papers and destroy them, or, you know, that, that sort of thing. And uh, this went on for quite some time. And eventually, uh, it got worse. And of course, in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated in Tennessee, in Nashville. I'm sorry, in Memphis, Tennessee. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. He was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, which you know, 1916. And what you don't know is that a massive rebellion broke out in all the cities in Tennessee. And as a result of that rebellion breaking out, the um, authorities, the, the governor and the others, uh, tried SNCC and, and the Black Panther Party. They, they didn't know very much about the Black Panther Party then. It was a new organization. But they, they um, tried them for treason. They tried them for treason. Of course, this is 1968. And um, they started a so-called black power grand jury that was going on all over the uh, state to investigate uh, the, um, you know, snake and the Black Panther Party, and investigating the rebellions themselves as being part of some, everything back then was a communist conspiracy. It's a communist conspiracy. These blacks don't have the sense enough to rise up like this. They had to be trained. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, <clears throat> they were trying to get me to come to the grand jury. They were trying to arrest me. And uh, I was told by a cop that I went to school with. 
He said, man, I'm going to tell you this. And you didn't get this from me. He said, but these people don't intend, if they arrest you, they don't intend for you to come out of jail alive. I'm going to just tell you like it is. And he told me that. And I took it to heart and um, made arrangements to get out of the city, uh, which I did. And, um, but the FBI, you know, its reach was all across the country. And uh, it um, started an investigation and started looking for me. And so I had to leave the country. And the quickest way to leave the country back in that day was to, uh, to hijack a plane to Cuba. And that is what I did. I hijacked a plane to Cuba. I asked for political asylum. Um, and, um, well, that's a story in and of itself. I, I didn't necessarily receive political asylum, to be quite honest. Uh, there was a, a problem with the Cuban government and the Black Panther Party at the time. Um, some people say it was caused by Eldridge Cleaver and his antics and so forth when he was in Cuba. I don't know that for a fact, but I have to believe, give some credence to it because I saw things when I was there. And um, But at any rate, I was in the jail there in Cuba for a brief period of time. And then uh, I was shipped out of the country and sent to uh, Czechoslovakia. Now, I don't know why I was sent to Czechoslovakia. And uh, this was right after the, um, the Russians had invaded the country, that Warsaw Pact, that, which didn't exist today, as a military pact. Uh, they had invaded the country and, you know, and uh, put it under occupation. So I was there at that time. And somehow the American authorities, well, they had, a, first of all, they had an embassy there in Czechoslovakia, in Prague, which is kind of surprising, really, because of the, that was during the time of the so-called Cold War between the United States and Russia. And, um, but at any rate, they had an embassy there. And uh, they sent some people out looking for me, and they captured me and took me into the uh, em embassy. And they were going to, um, you know, just arrest me and take me back to the, to the United States right then. No questions asked. And um, instead, what happened, I got a chance to escape, a break, and I went for it. And I got away and, uh, and went on the run. And I was on the run for maybe a month or so. And um, I, and I went some some really weird places, some interesting places. I went. At first, there was a group of um, uh, so-called gypsies or, or Roma people, and uh, I saw them there and when I was getting off the train uh, after I got out of uh, uh, Czech, uh, Prague, and I saw them at the, the train station, and I, just, I don't know why, I just walked up and started talking to them, and of course, they didn't know what, in the, what, what I was saying, but they didn't speak English, except for one person. One person spoke English, and somehow I was able to tell him that I was in trouble, I needed help, I, I considered them brothers and sisters and so forth and so on, and, um, and asked for help. And they took me to a so-called gypsy camp, as they call it. <clears throat> in England, they call them travelers, uh, but in the United States, they call them gypsies, but they're Roma, they're Roma people. And they have a historical experience that's very similar to the oppression of blacks. They, in fact, were on, um, they were chattel slaves on um, plantations in Eastern Europe, in Rom Romania, and, uh, and other countries as well. And they've never had their rights, just, just like black people haven't had their rights. They may not be slaves right now, but they, you know, but they were slaves for hundreds of years. And so we started talking to him, this one person who could speak English. And he said, I'm gonna take you to a place they'll never find you, you know. And so I went with the Roma people <laughs> into a, a so-called gypsy camp, you know, which is really just, a, in, in this day, and you know, in the later stages of life, they, they, they put them in what, it, what essentially are uh, estates council or, or some kind of pro uh, projects. That's what, that's what they were. Anyway, they lived in these uh, ghettos you know, like black people lived in ghettos in the United States. And they kept me there and, and for, for a good period, period of time, I hid out there. And, a, and the police never came there. One reason they didn't come there is because it was a, like an outlaw zone, a no-go area. And the police would come there and they would fight them like hell. You know, 
they might shoot at them or anything. They had they had rebellions. They had all kind of stuff going on in that area. So it was a no go zone for the police, and it was a great place for me to hide out. And I hid out there for, for quite a while. But I, <clears throat> eventually, I was supposed to have. Uh, there were some African students in Czechoslovakia that I'd met, and they had made arrangements for me to go to Africa to um, for asylum. And um, I attempted to do that, you know, and um, I left, which you could say was a mistake. But I couldn't stay forever with, with the uh, gypsies as much as I wanted to. I'm not going to call them gypsies. That's disrespectful. With the Roma, with the Roma people, I stayed there for quite some time. And um, then I left, and that was a stupid mistake on my part. I shouldn't have left. I'd, I'd probably still be on, on the run, but I'd, be, I'd have been free all those years. And, uh, you know, you can't go back and repeat history, though. At any rate, after I left them and went on my way to uh, East Germany, to Berlin, um, I, I got there, stayed with the students for a brief period of time, and then were recaptured, was recaptured by security agents of, um, this wasn't the CIA, it was something called the Bureau of National Research, which used to, be, I don't even know if it still exists today, but at any rate, what I'm saying, it was part of the State Department. It was a security wing of the State Department. And these are the people who trained um, the secret police in, um, in, in Iran under the Shah. They uh, trained the uh, secret police uh, in uh, South Vietnam and used them against the people. And uh, they were involved with all kinds of skullduggery uh, in, uh, in the world. And hardly anyone knew about them. They were a super secret agency. And somehow they wound up coming after me. They wound up coming after me. They, they grabbed me. They didn't say, well, you're under arrest, so and so on. They just grabbed me. They stabbed a needle in my arm and, you know, a needle with some sort of fluid and um, knocked me out and just drug me out into a car. And I, and I didn't wake up until... I was uh, in so-called Western Berlin, West Berlin. And um, I was kept there for some time and, 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 and tortured for information and all kinds of stuff. Eventually, the FBI started demanding that they bring me back to the United States, and that's what happened. So I came back to the United States, got two life sentences in, in, in a short period of time. Of course, I met, let me just say this, in between the time they, they got and brought me back to the United States, I was put in the uh, uh, Federal House of Detention in New York, I met Martin Sastry, which was the uh, one of the main uh, activist prisoners in the world, probably the best known political prisoner in the world at that time. And um, he talked with me every day while I was in that facility. And um, he drummed anarchism into my brain, you know, as a, as a political alternative. And he was really concerned about me because I was facing the death penalty. And he tried to help me, you know, in terms of my case and so forth. Uh, but the discussions we had there changed my life. The discussions I had with Martin Sostry. Uh First, he was a heavy intellectual, but he he wasn't a, he wasn't a writer. Otherwise, more people would know about him. Actually, he was a, an organizer, leader, and um, an intellectual. You know, and he taught me a lot of stuff. He taught me really the foundations of anarchism and the foundations, particularly of uh, so-called black anarchism, or uh, what I call the black autonomy. And um, so having met with, I, I met with him, and then I, I left there and went to Georgia. And like I said, in, in Georgia, I was given two life sentences by an all-white jury, a Klan jury, you know, in a Klan area. It, I wasn't tried in Atlanta, which has a, you know, a majority black population. I was tried in a racist hellhole. Even the marshals told me this. They took me down there. So that's a racist hellhole, a clan hovel, you know, and I didn't have a chance, you know, I was, you know, and I could have been sentenced to death, but the judge who was a hanging judge had a reputation as a hanging judge said, if I sentence this man to death, all these white, uh, these white liberals and Jews and all the rest of them would be coming down here and these civil rights Negroes and all the rest of them be coming down to this county trying to save him. So I'm going to sentence him to natural life in prison without any possibility of parole. And he'll die in prison. That's what he said. And uh, so they took me out, and I came to the prison system. And for 15 years, you know, I, I served 15 years in prison. I could have served all my time in prison, 
but I had a one I had an um, outside defense organization, the Anarchist Black Cross, and others um, was able to lead a worldwide campaign on my behalf. Also, inside the United States, you know, there were groups that I had worked with and so forth that that uh, supported me, and uh, we were able to put enough pressure on the government eventually over the course of time that one they did away with the um, the law that said that you know you could be sentenced to death. You could be sentenced to death for um, you know hijacking a plane, wherever to Cuba, anywhere else. You could be sent. You know they 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 did away with that law. It was ruled unconstitutional. And uh, <clears throat> then also my sentence, they had to reduce my sentence so I could receive a trial. They didn't reduce the life portion. Of it. They just what they just did is that instead of me having the um, waiting, you know, not having a chance of parole, they gave me uh, the opportunity that I would effectively be eligible for parole immediately. And so I got out, and as I said, I came back and I came back home uh, to uh, Tennessee and started working uh, in Tennessee against the Klan and the cops, and uh, it, which was really a, a serious issue there. The police had killed, at that time when we talk about in, in, in 1983, the city of Chattanooga had the largest number of police killings in the country for any city, any city under 200,000 people. That comes from the Department of Justice. That's not my opinion. And um, so we organized uh, when I got there. I met, I met two, two black women. And these two black women uh, were friends. And one of them, father, had been murdered in the city jail, beaten to death and choked. And so we started a campaign around that. But then the campaign eventually spread to other cases of people who had been murdered there over the years, over a long period of time. Uh, Ku Klux Klan cops, uh, and, and, that, and what I'm saying that I'm not saying that as a uh, some sort of slogan. I'm saying Ku Klux Klan cops were in the city police department, and they were doing these things, these killings, and uh, they were they had impunity, just like they do today, really uh, impunity against uh, these uh, these murders. And so we started this campaign, and we for 15 years we we had waged a campaign against uh, police terrorism. You know. And uh, although Chattanooga is a small city of about 175,000, 200,000 people, uh, it was jumping. It was hot. It was the most, uh, had the most uh, protests of any uh, city in the South at that time. People were coming from other cities, bigger cities, Atlanta, Nashville, even Memphis were coming to Chattanooga because we, we had that city rocking. We were fighting. We, you know, we were uh, resisting the Klan by any means necessary, resisting the cops by any means necessary. And we were winning, you know, which is more important. And um, then, um, you know, we had this massive, massive um, um, demonstration. I think that was in 1987 against the um, against the Klan, and we filed a lawsuit. Also, uh, that was a year that a lot of things happened that was favorable to us. And uh, so in 1990, we won the case against the city government, which was a Klan. You know what? That There had been no black people in the government in, in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, since 1912. And so it was like a 90-year period uh, when we filed this lawsuit. We won this lawsuit. And uh, so they, you know, eventually had to allow blacks to run for office and so forth and so on, and had to allow blacks to vote and all this kind of thing. This is, and we're talking about, 1990, and they didn't really have the right to vote, you know. And so white supremacy has always been a serious problem, and it, and it still is a serious problem there, you know, even though they claim it's a new South and, and all this sort of propaganda. It is a racist place today, and you can go in there and you can get killed, you know, today. So um, realizing that, you know, uh, when, I, when I organized, the last thing I did in that city, I was organizing over the deaths of two black men, got charged, and uh, myself and three other members of Black Autonomy, um, which is a group I founded, you know, years ago, 1994, I think. It was the first, that was the first black anarchist collective in the United States. May have been in the world, but certainly in the United States. And uh, it's interesting that to this very day, you know, 
is now a series of new black anarchist organizations that have been founded. And of course, I have no doubt, you know, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, but I have no doubt that it was because of, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it was because of the work that myself and others in the uh, Black Autonomy Federation did that resulted in this, uh, this new upsurge of Blacks. They read the book, they had the book, was accessible to read. Uh, the work we did and the, and the, and the, and the contradictions we raised uh, and, our, and our battles against the ruling class and all of that, those things have inspired a new generation. I, I, I don't like to look at it this way, but somebody said, well, you're the father of the black anarchist movement. And I said, well, now, I don't know about all of that. Uh, but to some extent, it may be true. I don't know. And, and if it is, so what? The main thing is that we, New movements are on, on the scene today. I feel there's a responsibility myself to try to, if they reach out to me, and they have, to help them uh, come to fruition and, and even go way past what we did. I think that's important. Okay, so I guess you could look at look at me and look at my background and say uh, it's a, 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 a radical background, true enough. But the things we organize against and still do organize against, say, for instance, austerity in the United States. And austerity in the United States is racialized like everything else. Uh, the amount of poverty, the highest level of poverty in the United States are black and maybe brown people, Latinx they call them now. Um, you know, then, then the indigenous people as well, you know, the so-called Indians, they used to call them. Um, they also are still trapped on the reservation. These are economic prisons. The ghetto, the barrio, the uh, Indian reservation are all the same basic means of controlling peoples of color in the United States. And now we each have a separate history in relation to the United States government, what became the United States government. And to this very day, people are poor and starving on reservations, poor and starving in black ghettos, poor and starving in barrios. And this is as a result of this system, the way it was constructed based on the, the, the labor, the land, and uh, the resources of the uh, peoples, of, peoples of color who were, were here. Um, those who came as slaves, like my ancestors, those uh, uh, indigenous people who, who were in the, United, in, in the country and who um, had to fight a war, a war of survival against the United States government and its uh, expeditionary troops. And the, uh, <clears throat> the lands that were stolen from Mexico and the people that were stolen from Mexico, um, all of this has to be factored into an understanding of the United States as a system and as an economy have to be factored in. So what you've had in the United States, the, 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 you know, years have gone by, we know we've had socialist tendencies and all that and ra ra radical groups, but they've all been white. They haven't, they haven't in any way touched the existence of black people for the most part, or, or, or you know, other peoples of color, other oppressed peoples of color, they haven't touched them. And so uh, <clears throat> for the most part, you find that the movements that have come into existence with black people and other peoples of color are with black leaders, black organizers, and black organizations. Now that doesn't mean to say that <clears throat> they're unwilling to work with other uh, peoples, doesn't mean that, but the predicament and the level of uh, oppression and poverty among peoples of color far exceeds what happens to whites. Now, there are white people who are very poor. Don't, don't get me wrong. There are some in Appalachia, uh, for sure, and, and other places, but the, the type of, the type of uh, structure that oppresses black people and other people of color is different. It's different. And when white people can get money and get jobs and so forth, black people can't, for the most part. 
And um, it's only when we have fought, fought for uh, these basic rights or these or the same ability to be treated equally, it's only when we're willing to do that that we get anything, anything whatsoever. But we're looking now, we're at a new stage now, and I'm gonna detract a, a lot of the time frame from uh, my, my personal story, you know. I was just to distract from that to talk about the issue of poverty and oppression under the capitalist system right now in the United States. I can't talk about the entire world. I haven't lived everywhere. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the United States because the United States is going to cause, and it's causing, a, um, a depression, another depression. Just like the United States calls the, the 1930s, the 1929 depression. The United States calls that, you know, the, the economy and the uh, Wall Street, the collapse of Wall Street. And we're seeing similar things today, although it's being brought on by the um, coronavirus and so forth. Um, nevertheless, it is crippling the economy of the United States and crippling even the political structure. It's creating contradictions where people will have to fight to survive. And, you know, right now, the last time I checked, there were 61.9 million people who have had to apply for unemployment. 61.9 million, that far exceeds the Great Depression itself. And um, they're getting nothing from the government. I mean, I know it's Trump and all that, but they're getting nothing from the government, period. And um, he's trying to even cut the social programs that already exist. So whatever movement comes into existence now to fight this, and it hasn't come in yet, uh, but whatever movement comes into existence has got to be a movement that understands uh, how race and class intersect. You know, how they intersect and how um, you can't build a movement strictly talking about, you know, <clears throat> this is thing about a term that's being used a lot. They only call it fascism when it happens to, wh to white people. And what that term really means is that black people are being, blacks and other peoples of color are being oppressed every day, subjected to police killings, subjected to starvation, subjected to genocide, partial or otherwise. And they don't call that fascism. They don't call it, they don't say that the state is an entity that sustains fascism. Now, so, Black people, and especially the Black Panther Party when it came into existence, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of uh, uh, the things about the party in terms of just uh, uh, romanticism. I'm going to talk about the historical significance of one program that they created, and it was um, what essentially now is being called Black Anti-Fashion. Back in the day, it was, it was, it was something else. But this movement, the party itself, was a uh, living embodiment of an anti-fascist movement. Uh, well, now, when they, we know that they did engage in armed self-defense against the uh, fascist organizations, the street-level organizations, that we, they call them now, but they engaged in, in, in combat against them, and they wiped them out whenever they came in, con in contact with them or beat them back. In addition to that, they organized communities to be able to resist without their organization being a part, <clears throat> which is really something. And uh, they also had a conference in 1968, I think it was, uh, the United Front Against Fascism. And there they were trying to get a uh, front a movement around their, their predicament in terms of the government uh, wipe, then wiping them out with the counterinsurgency or counterintelligence program. <clears throat> and um, they also um, built this organization because they wanted to raise the level of consciousness and organizing against uh, police terrorism, against uh, you know racism and, and all the exploitation that happens in black communities. And at that time, uh, you know, there were popular movements among whites as well, and the Black Panther Party was very popular. So when that conference took place, 
the majority of participants were actually white. And of course, this startled and scared the living bejesus out of the FBI. They wanted to know how in the hell this happened. And of course, uh, but of course, the, there were other elements that criticized the Black Panther Party for doing that or having that develop. Uh, well, look at this. Maybe. That initial uh, group, which many of which didn't stay with it, uh, but it laid the foundation of another anti-fascist movement. Uh, the National Committee to Combat Fascism. And that organization lasted longer. Uh, and um, it was effective in one of the things it did do, it raised the level of consciousness to such an extent that in, ten, in, in instances where the police might have raided a, a, a Black Panther Party office, and there were a number of those, masses of people will walk uh, and, you know, around and cover the building so that the police couldn't just rush in and kill all the uh, people inside or rest on the people inside, whichever the case may be. Um, more importantly, they turn the community against the police, the whole idea of there being a police. Why should there be a police in a black community? Or in any community, for that matter. <laughs> Why, who, and who does the police represent? And it certainly is a truth that it does not represent the people. They don't protect and serve black and brown and other communities, you know, even poor white communities. They don't do it. They don't exist to do it. They exist to control those communities with massive police force if they have to. And that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing that what we're seeing today with the police is that they uh, have impunity and they uh, have been given military implements. And so they are using that to just kill people at random, kill black people, particularly at random. Uh, for any, anything, you know, many of these cases that have been shown um, is just somebody that, you know, they grab on the street. They grab and choke a number of people to death like that on the street. And this has been going on for many, many years. And um, if we take their figures as to how many people die each year in the United States from police terror, then we have to say that in point of fact, this is warfare. This is this is what class warfare looks like. This is what ter this is what police terrorism looks like, and this is why you can't reform the police. Now I'm one of the few saying that. I'm gonna be quite honest with you. I'm, the, I'm one of the few in the United States saying that. But anyway, so we have to look at all this stuff that's happening today in the context of the capitalist system being in trouble, resorting to police state technique uh, techniques. Uh, resorting to corporate fascism. That's, that's what Trump represents. He represents corporate fascism. Now he's, he doesn't have the intelligence to run everything himself, but he is in position that those around him and those financing him that you don't even see, uh, or that they are benefiting from his being in office. And his sec if he can get his second term in, it'll be much more dangerous for people who look like me or or other people in fact activists you know people in the streets that are fighting police terror all these people he wants to eliminate destroy with police terror and with military tactics that's what he wants to do he wants to take away any right to have legal protests or any protests he wants to in fact make every protest illegal and a crime, and he wants to have total control under a uh, personal dictatorship. That's what he wants. That's what's happening right now. People find it hard to believe these things are happening. Oh my goodness, uh, what's going on? Well, what's going on is something you could have predicted two, three years ago. Uh, he's consolidating his rule. He's, he's adopting more harsh measures, and if he can get back in or hold on to power by hook or crook, he will even be more dangerous. Then we can talk about all kinds of stuff happening. But it isn't just Trump. The entire system is bankrupt and the entire system is corrupt. Whether he gets elected or not, reelected or not, the other guy coming in behind him, he's a crook too. And he's a, he's a, um, he may be a politician with a different style, but he certainly is a, has the same objectives to keep this system alive and lord it over the people. Anyway, um, 
I don't know what else I'm supposed to say here. Uh, I hope I said something that made any sense whatsoever. Um, and I, I will tell you that I was tremendously uh, appreciative of the call to come in here and uh, say what I did, what I did have to say. Um, I'm a, I'm a black activist, and, and I don't apologize for that. Uh, but what I will say is I'm a class conscious revolutionary, and I understand uh, in order to ultimately defeat the system, we will have to unite all forces that we can unite. No problem there. But poor black people who have leadership potential in their own movements and so forth, and who, who really have a different kind of movement, um, versus in the United States, Antifa, who was a group I criticize all the time because of, they think that the greatest danger of fascism comes from the street forces of the fascist movement, the various tendencies, where they come and go. They, they think that that's the biggest threat. And especially now, we have to say that the biggest threat of fascism is the state. It's the state that creates the fascist regime, the state and capital. And um, we should be fighting the state. I mean, it's almost, I'm not saying that the forces in the street are, we should just ignore them. But we got to understand that Trump controls those people. He proved that the other night at a so-called debate. He controls the Proud Boys and all these other fascist tendencies. He came in the office with a uh, collective of groups and movements, all extreme right movements. He came in the office with them. It's not just him calling the shots. He may be the face. He may be the buffoon. But in point of fact, there are elements within the state and the, you know, and the, and the capitalist system that get some benefit out of him where they would have gotten rid of him a long time ago. So that's what I can say. I hope it made sense. Hope I, don't, I wanted to give you my perspective at least. Um, austerity is linked intrinsically to capitalism and the state. We have to understand that. We have to fight it. We can't take the posture that because these are government programs or, or something or other that people have been surviving on, we can just overlook them and, and, and don't overlook anything. You can't create, unless you can create an alternative, then don't tell people not to uh, receive government programs that many of times that they fought for, you know, over the years. Um, poor people and, and black people in the Welfare Rights Organization, which was one of the major anti-poverty and anti-poor organizations in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s. Independent, run by black women who were the recipients of uh, so-called welfare programs. And they fought tooth and nail against attempts to destroy these programs. Now they ultimately were destroyed by a so-called liberal. And sadly, because of racism in the United States and opportunism, um, these black women didn't have the strong support they should have had from the labor unions and from other forces in the civil rights movement and so forth. And this is because of class snobbery against these black uh, poor women who didn't have the pedigree that uh, these elements from the black colleges or the, or the you know, establishment had. But anyway, I hope I said something here tonight and made some sense. I'm not a college professor, by the way. I've never lectured to college. Well, I, I'm not asking you a lie. I've never lectured at college. I've been called in two lectures. But I've never, um, I'm not a college uh, professor, an academic. I've always been a grassroots organizer, a revolutionary grassroots organizer, but a grassroots organizer. That's all I've ever been. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, and I take pride in that. 
but I haven't sold out, that I haven't uh, sought uh, some kind of um, entry or entree to uh, the middle class or to the, the upper crust. I haven't sought that. I haven't sold out to that. So that's been me. That's been my life, the part of it I want to talk about, and that's been the things I wanted to talk about. And uh, as I said, I hope you got something out of it, uh, and you can ask me questions.